This episode is brought to you by the Evolving Psychedelic Ecosystem, an upcoming free live stream featuring a conversation about impact, innovation, and insights as access to psychedelics expand, featuring the guests Alex Belser, Sarah Reed, Kalia Taylor, and former guest of the podcast, Julian Vane. This free live stream is being put together by the Synthesis Institute, a highly reputable center in the Netherlands for psychedelic retreats and psych psychedelic practitioner training. Again, this is a free live stream. So if you head to jameswgesso.com forward slash psychedelic ecosystem, you can sign up and attend for free. So which is exciting. And I'll see you there because I'm also going to attend. I'll talk a little bit more about this at the very end of the episode. So stay tuned to that if you care to. Um, and uh, otherwise, here's the intro music. Okay, so welcome back to Adventures Through the Mind. I'm your host, as always, James W. Gesso. This podcast explores topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research, and always with the underlying question of how can we work with and through our psychedelic experiences to become better people, not just for ourselves, but for all those with whom we are nested in relationship presently and across time, human and non-human, perhaps even for life as a whole, life itself. Lofty goals, but you know, the, 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 the anchoring of the inquiry, be it lofty, at least guides a kind of exploration that might enlighten and illuminate us to various elements of how, even at a fractional expression, um, something like becoming better people is possible. And uh, this episode is guided by a central inquiry specifically, and it's something like, what is the evolutionary role of psilocybin in human consciousness? Not only is this the guiding implicit inquiry, it's also at some point an explicit question in this conversation you're going to hear today with our guest, Jahan Khamezadeh, PhD. But who is this Jahan person? He is the author of the Psilocybin Connection, Psychedelics, the Transformation of Consciousness, and the Evolution of the Planet, an Integral Approach, which is based on his research during his doctorate program in Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness at the Californian Institute for Integral Studies. The book came out this year, 2022. Aside from his academic work, he has undergone several major trainings, including graduating from the Hakomi Somatic Psychotherapy Program and training with the Mazatec Mushroom Tradition. He assisted the Psychedelic Assisted Psychotherapy Certificate Training at the California Institute for Integral Studies for two years and mentored at the School of Consciousness Medicine. He works as a facilitator for legal psilocybin mushroom ceremonies in Jamaica with Atman Retreats and is on the Silo Health Integration Team. He volunteers at the Zendo Project and led a monthly group called Developing a Relationship with Sacred Mushrooms with the San Francisco Psychedelic Society. So part of me, I'm going to continue to read off my notes here as I give you an outline of what the episode is about. Uh, but yes, together, Jahan and I have a wide-ranging discussion that starts with a wondering about the cultural place psychedelics are presently in with their growing rise to the mainstream and corporate fame. From there, we go into the role psychedelics can play in building strong but healthy egos, why taking heroic doses is not the best way to heal or learn and may actually hurt you, how our drive for connection has been violated by modern life but remains available to us if we learn how to heal the wounds we carry as a consequence of modern life, and why an understanding of psychedelics requires us to transcend reductionism and materialism. Furthermore, the conversation waves in and out from microscopic to the cosmologic as we also discuss the role fungi in general have played and continue to play in the evolution and existence of life and consciousness on this planet, how psilocybin may have assisted in the development of human consciousness, psychedelic molecules in the Gaia mind, 
the infinite variability of unity, the voice of the mushroom, the voice of God, and the archetypal structure of reality. We even talk about how the genetic expression that leads to ADHD might have driven the very evolution of human con consciousness through its quest for novelty and an inclination to wander. So it's a big episode and was a lot of fun to have this conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. Before we get into it, a uh, big thank you to my patrons on Patreon, especially the people whose names are listed on the screen here on YouTube or in the description to this episode, wherever you're checking it out. Some of you have been giving quite significantly uh, for quite some time, and I really appreciate that. The names you're seeing on the screen here are also people who have given significant one-time PayPal donations since the last episode. So a big thank you to those people and to all of my patrons as you make this podcast possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you are not yet a patron and you are finding value in the show, please do become uh, consider becoming one by heading to patreon.com forward slash James W. Gesso and signing up to basically just toss me a tip once a month for the time and energy that goes into producing the show as a thank you for the value you are receiving from it. Um, anything is something and even the price of just a cup of coffee goes a long way. So thank you for considering doing that. Without much more further ado, here is my conversation with Jahan Hamsezade on Adventures Through the Mind, episode 165. Enjoy. All right. Well, let's let's get into it then. Um Please. actually, how do you pronounce your name? So I <clears throat> I yeah. don't even I, I don't even know that I've attempted other than just recognizing mm -hmm. its spelling to say your last name. But what I'm yeah. what I think is how you pronounce your first name, it's Yahan or ya Jahan. Which is it? Jahan. 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 Okay. Yeah. And then your last name? The last name, Khamse Zade. Ham. Khamse Zade. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, no, you got it. No. I feel it's, so self-conscious. Uh, no, no. Ham. Uh huh. Se. Se. Yeah. Za. Za. De. De. Ham. Se. Za. De. Ham se zade. Yeah. Yahan Jahan Ham se zade. Thank you. Pretty yeah. good. Okay. Pretty good. Pretty okay. good. Welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Um I just went through the notations, uh, the notes that I took reading your book. Um, as I tend to take pretty extensive notes and then I organize them later. And uh, so we'll see what ends up emerging out of this conversation because your book is quite thorough. It has a specific tract and there are pieces that are held in there and your sort of like larger body of what you could offer here is going to be bigger than what's in your book anyways. So I've got a spattering of notes with a sense of having read your book, a trust that we're going to find a golden thread in the conversation. Um, but first off, I wanted to start by thanking you explicitly for including me in your book. Um, I feel like Decomposing the Shadow was actually a very significant contribution to the psychedelic field, being that mm -hmm. it came out in 2013 and it started saying, hey, you can basically you know, heal some depression and other mental illness by learning to feel more deeply and like connect with the intelligence of the mushroom and here's how to do it mm -hmm. and think about it. Um, well before anyone else was talking about it in the modern phase, in the most recent phase. Mm -hmm. And yet it doesn't totally. really get a lot of a lot of credit, I don't think, at least among uh, the academic group. Although I've had a number of academics tell me they personally have loved it and personally were inspired by it, but you know, just can't cite it properly because I'm not really anyone mm. and it's a self-published book mm. and so on and so forth. Yeah. No, I want to honestly, you know, say thank you for putting it out there at a time where a lot of people weren't writing. You know, um, I think I, it was about 2014, 15, where I completely gave all my attention to psilocybin to do my dissertation on and I pretty much had to find every book that was existed between 2015 to all the way to, to 2019. And there weren't that many, you know, so it took a lot of, I think, courage to kind of break the ice and put things out there when not a lot of people were. And as you probably know, in the last couple of years, it's just like this flood of new people being interested in psychedelics and writing about it. So thanks for being one of the forerunners in this modern era. Cheers. Yeah. And and a lot of people writing about it that may or may not actually have a whole lot of uh a whole lot of ground to stand on with what they're with what they're reiterating. But that's a 
that's, I think, more so a consequence of the opportunistic sort of entrepreneurial space uh, and, and sort of psychedelics getting into that sort of profit-driven model of either social or financial capital gain uh, more so than perhaps the scene itself, but the scene being, I think, corrupted uh, by this other force. Yeah, there's a sense that there's been for a while, at some point there's going to be a wave, you know, that comes as once people start to realize the benefits of psychedelics and it reaches more of um, the cultural attention. And of course, there's going to be a lot of people that just want to ride a wave, you know, so there's definitely an opportunistic mind, a lot of profit. And I think some of it's also um, authentic enthusiasm where people have just taken psychedelics a couple of years ago and they're having a life changing experience. So they're really excited and being very vocal. You know, but they're lacking, you can say, that grounding or that depth that comes with time and a deep relationship with these medicines. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, probably like yourself, I'm assuming, but I know myself. I mean, much of why I wrote the book had a lot to do with the fact of like, wow, like I have to announce, I need to bring this message to the world. <laughs> um, and I think that's quite common for a lot of people. I think it's common in, especially in the early 20s for people feeling like they really know what's up and they got to bring it into the world. <laughs> Yeah. And if I think we're part of a larger collective, you know, consciousness, there's a need for that energy, right? There's a reason there's there that phase and there's vocalization and there's less fear. You can say in the early 20s and so on. And, you know, a lot of things shift as you move into the 30s. And so um, I think it serves a purpose, even though it's not as mature or as refined, you know, looking back maybe 10 years later after that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah certainly, certainly serves a purpose. But even I look back on the things w which were once wounds, you know, that have mm. come to be properly addressed, at least, or maybe significantly addressed, and to some extent healed, that things that I deeply care about now and foundations for which I feel still bring benefit deeply into my life, into the lives of others that sort of started in a root of a woundedness or a, yeah. or an immaturity. Like even this whole podcast writing a book thing, a lot of it had to do with like a deep wound where like I needed to feel like I was special, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. being able to connect with like, oh, I don't need to be special because that I exist is now an expression of like my fullest perfection and specialness manifest simply by existing without needing to do anything or have it be seen one by anyone in particular. And yet here's this beautiful thing that I've done that means a lot to me and has meant a lot to another mm. people. Thankfully, I healed that because it might really distort how I show up, might have me trying to ride that wave more so than I am. Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. I can see how being productive and creating things is, is a way to, you say, address that wound. I think at the root of it is that we all are special, like we are unique individuals. So specialness is a part of our essence, and that has to be, you know, integrated into our being for it to finally settle. It's only when we feel that we're not that we try to really externally keep showing that we are. Um, and there's a, if we look at Maslow's hierarchy, one of the stages is self-esteem. So I see most of us walking around trying to get self-esteem throughout the day. And it's only once you have enough self-esteem that you self-actualize. You need enough of a sense of self to feel good about yourself to really kind of settle into that identity of like, of course I'm enough. You know, we are, you know, I think you'd agree at the root more divine. And we need to feel large enough to really embrace that divinity. Mm -hmm. Well, this is interesting because again, trusting the golden thread, one of the things that has been emerging, you know, is the recognition, I think the the late great James Orrock described it as the ego's like a muscle. You tear it down and it comes back stronger again. And there's some studies coming out around the idea of spiritual narcissism, about how spiritual mm -hmm. practice actually strengthens that sort of, uh, mm -hmm. that, that self rather than softens and opens it up. And certainly that can produce a kind of narcissism, but in some sense, I think, that, and maybe you'll agree with me here, that's actually a mark of healing because perhaps mm. that sense of self, that sense of worth, that sense of whatever was actually quite fragmented, you know, and that sort of mm -hmm. recognition of it coming back stronger can actually be something quite powerful and positive as long as the context leading it is one that the sense of self come back, comes back stronger with also a sort of larger arc of connectedness and you know ethical behavior and care for other and compassion and all the rest the things i think explicitly the mushroom is trying to impart onto us by the way it holds us in our journeys 
No, well said. I think the, the mushroom is great at, you know, as, as you share in the subtitle of the book, a decomposing the shadow, kind of like dissolving our ego to have this larger sense of self. I have a lot of clients come with this idea of like, I want an ego death experience. And I think it's always right to ask like, well, who's the one asking? Spirit's not saying kill the ego. There's, you know, it's, there's a bit, I think, of almost self-hate or I want out of my prison in that sense of like, I want to have this ego death. And I think we need healthy egos. You know, it's like spirit didn't fuck up by being like, let's grow egos. To your point where you're saying, I think we need transparent egos, right? So it's not opaque. It's like it's transparent to the light underneath it. But I think it's healthy to have an identity. You know, we've done a lot of work to evolve and form identities. You know, so it's, it's kind of self-actualizing the deep potential that we have. And part of that is that deep sense of interconnection that we're all one, which I think is a good you know, response to the inflation and in narcissism. Narcissism is like everything revolves around me and I'm only special. So like we're all different, you know, particles of light, you know, is another way to kind of land into that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And especially too, if you consider there's a kind of false humility that sort of creates a sort of spiritual pride around minimizing mm-hmm. the self, even language that never acknowledges there's an I or a me present, right? Which has some utility, but then at some point it's like, it's almost entirely self-obsessed in its total self-extinction. Um, and that mm. being a, um, why did I bring this up? Um, mm. that, the, that e- even in the language of sort of, you said like the ego, having an ego is healthy. You want to have a transparent one, which means you don't want mm-hmm. to overly inflate yourself to the point that you're like, boom. But even that sort of like absolute mm. minimization is a sort of backwards inflation as well, which again, I would I so. see rooted in a kind of core trauma that we probably all share growing up in a coercive world. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people that getting on a spiritual path. So, I mean, I started 18, had a huge spiritual experience. And so it's been about like 20 years now. And I think there's a large period there, you know, looking at Buddhism and so on, where the focus is on a no self, where it can get very confusing on the journey. You know, the whole point is empty out, empty out. And I think there's some truth to that, but I think so much of development has to be with creating a very healthy self. I, I feel in terms of guiding work, you know, holding the space uh, in Jamaica and so on, a part of it is creating a deep identity and transforming the identity. It's a wounded identity that we're trying to grow out of and moving towards a healthy one. So identities, I think, at the core part of the transformation work. But to, to the point of, like, say, the Buddhists and the no self, there was like five days that I just journeyed almost all day, every day, really focused on what is the self. And I didn't find anything there in the sense that there was emptiness, right? But there was still a deep sense of me-ness, of I-ness, right? But I thought I would hit some core solid thing. And it's like, it's not a solid thing. We are these imaginations. I mean, space is largely empty, right? But it's full of presence and consciousness, right? So there's a felt sense of self, even though it's not like a, like a rock, you know? So... I, th- I think it's both and we are here to create these identities while we're alive, part of a large story. And I think part of the power comes is in that emptiness, we have a sense to create. And we are partly here to create that identity. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah. When you brought up Buddhism, and I don't know this to be true, but I what I understand is like the roots of Buddhism were in like the no self and these types of practices were for basically monastic type traditions and they have Mm. a lot of utility when they're translated into like living the relational life um but simply taken as they are i think can yeah create a Mm -hmm. like i think that even the most beautiful um and wise spiritual or religious tradition can be used as a sort of like external structure by which you know, our wounds are compensated for in ways that are not as wise and beautiful as they mm. are attaching themselves to, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And something else that like comes up when you're saying kind of the more of these monastic religions is, um, you know, I think it's nice to contextualize they're part of a patriarchal culture where it's largely men that kind of did these kind of practices of silence and emptying out. <laughs> And coming from more of a like a tantra approach, right? It's like the masculinity is more that emptiness, that observer, the seer, while the feminine is life. Like right? she is the wave, she is Maya, she is the dance. And so, also for people that are more feminine identified coming into it, you know, I, I see meditation of more of a structured, disciplined, masculine approach, while something like dance. You know, sexuality or sensuality is a way for women to create with spirituality, because for them, I think it's more of a fullness. 
you know, at the deep kind of feminine essence than an emptiness. You know, I see she is what's the world that's moving and radiant and the masculinity is a seer, you know. So even in that, and I think it's good to contextualize for most of these practices came from a, a male perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, you you saying that, I mean, male, uh, male, masculinity, patriarchy, yes. And I've also, after reading um, Darsha Narvaez and Four Arrows, their book on the the kinship worldview. Actually, the last interview I did was a, was last week, and it was with them, uh, or recorded, oh. not released. And um, in that section, he talked about shifting away from masculine, feminine language to solar lunar language, as mm. to even further degender. Because even though masculine, feminine isn't necessarily gendered terminology, it's hard not to interpret it as such. He talks about the sort of like dominance of the solarity uh, and how it has sort of like attempted to like crush out the 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 lunar energies or something to this extent. Mm-hmm. And so with even with that, you know, the solar energies shine directly straight, you know, like down unabatingly at, you know, um, mm-hmm. penetrating. And the lunar energies is receptive. It, re- it receives mm-hmm. and shines. And then also, I mean, obviously light and the sun has a lot to do with the water cycle but i'm just thinking about like how the moon moves the great waters of the earth as well Mm. um and in some sense the great waters of ourselves depending on where you're at with respect to astrology Mm. yeah as a as a shared you know right before we got on uh, there's a few years i studied archetypal astrology because i think it has a lot of correlations with psychedelic experiences and a lot of people within that field also were trying to shift towards the ideas of um, lo- lunar and solar. And then the only thing that comes up for me around that is because we all have lo- like lunar and solar qualities. Again, like the part we put out to the world and shines and the part that's more like internal and hidden and we kind of show more with like a sensitive group of vulnerable people and so on. But, you know, really being inspired by a kind of tantric cosmologies also from that perspective, you know, I think we can all agree, people that venture into psychedelics, that there's a unity and a oneness. But at some point, this one being splits into two. And from this perspective, one's masculine, one's feminine. And we see this run throughout all of nature, right? Throughout all species, right? Um, and so part of this is to say that masculine and feminine might not be a cultural construct. Um, and I'm not saying that there's not conditionings within culture that keeps us limited to when it comes to masculine and feminine. But it might be a deep part of the structure of the cosmos itself, right? That's why we see it throughout, again, the entire animal kingdom. It's it's how they reproduce and so on. Um, and so I think there's a lot of freeing that can be done by changing things out of gender terms. And what if these two are actual beings, these archetypal entities that we're always actually in dialogue with? Mm. Yeah. You know, the archetypal yeah. entities thing really lines up with uh, – I'm. I hope I'm not going to butcher this – Chris, if you're listening, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, you had mentioned Christopher Bache in your book. Um, yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I heard him once describe was like coming to see that uh, existence was these two massive archetypal beings that were animate living beings. And one, I think, was like the force of creation and the other one was something else. And that it essentially, like I'm thinking about masculine and feminine, and it was their love an infinite dance with itself that brought all of existence into creation. Um, And again, I probably did not represent that quote well, but it came to mind. And when I first read it, it was quite moving and it's moving for me now too. I I think you did represent it well. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Christopher Beige, taking a couple courses with him. His earlier book, Dark Night, Early Dawn, read it three times. It was probably my favorite book for many years. And that passage also, uh, you know, really deeply had resonance for me and Partly because I had psychedelic experiences that were very similar, were dissolving all the point to merging with this larger divine feminine as if my whole being had been waiting for this my entire life. And in this space of emptiness of those just like the, me and, and her large energy dancing, I felt some of the most deep contentment I've ever felt because there had always been this hunger for that. You know, so that, again, that kind of led me to give more credit to this worldview that we are part of these two divine beings moving at all times, dancing. And in many ways, the whole universe we see is an interplay between these two forces. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I think uh, 
I think Beige talks about this too, like the causal realm. And like from that are other archetypal beings that emerge too, that are living animate animate beings that we experience as larger patterns acting through us. But in some sense, we are the characters that those larger animate beings are playing across essentially a time that is nonlinear. Yeah, I love it. No, totally. You know, these are the type of ideas that I wouldn't have given credit to if it wasn't for the direct experiences that's possible, you know, with psychedelics. But it's also not so far from things we've been seeing throughout history in terms of like Hinduism, you know, their idea is that there's there's Brahman, there's this large being that is dreaming. And within the dream, he is also all the characters and that each individual one he calls Atman, right? And I think it's a pretty spot on metaphor for our reality. Right. The only idea within this other archetypal world is that this large being also splits into two beings, you know, and from there splits into this infinity of beings, you know, at least eight, almost eight billion humans on Earth, all the animals and perhaps, you know, expanded throughout the entire cosmos. Sure. And, and if you lean into the, uh, the, the model of the mind that emerges out of something like internal family systems, where we're a multiplicity of beings internally, then even the individual person breaks down into a symphony of selves, as is the title of, uh, actually, that's the title of a book. Fadiman. Fadiman. I actually you, just yeah, got it yeah. to be diving into soon. So looking forward that's, to that. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a really beautiful. Yeah, totally. I think it's definitely a shift the worldview that we are a multiplicity of, of being. I mean, even our bodies, like some like 39 trillion cells, right? And I think also scaling upwards, not just down, but within psychically we're all these beings, but upwards, if we keep following that structure, you know, to say that the earth itself is a being and that we are part of its cells, we are part of its multiplicity. You know, I think all together we are expressions of this, like the guy in being who is dreaming also through us. You know, so bringing that family system also upwards, we're part of that larger family that ultimately also is a part of a unity. Yeah. Now, uh, I feel like I, I might be offending the flow here, but you said Gaia, and now I'm going to slightly mm -hmm. shift the rapport and ask mm -hmm. you explicitly about Great. Gaia, because you speak quite a bit throughout, the, uh, throughout your book, right? Throughout your mm -hmm. book, you are outlining this sort of you know, my interpretation is like a theory for psilocybin's role in human evolution historically, mm -hmm. presently, and into the future, using integral theory as a basis, um, kind of reviving the stone ape theory at one point, and then throughout mm -hmm. that sort of weaving in the different sort of supported theories that would that would help us understand how and why psilocybin is supporting this evolution and what it reveals about the nature of life as we know it. And in that you go quite significantly into Gaia and Gaia mm -hmm. theory. And I'm wondering if given where we are in the conversation now, like weave that in. Mm -hmm, totally. I, I think it's the right context and it's the only real deep framework for which we can make sense of psychedelics. You know, since 15, I was really kind of focused on this question of how do psychedelics exist, all right? Like you're going to take a chemical compound that allows you to see things that aren't actually there. So how is it playing with our reality in this kind of way? And the best explanation I've come across is, is seeing it with an evolutionary and ecological context. These compounds evolved over millions of years. Right now it's believed maybe psilocybin 68 million years old. And it's still – it's a part of an organism, um, you know, say the fungi kingdom that evolved it seems about 2.5 billion years ago, right? So we've been in this deep web and enmeshment with these entire life forces for a long time. You know, creating these compounds that, you know, now we know psilocybin fits into the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor better than serotonin itself, creates a hyper-connected brain state, stimulates neurogenesis, the growth of new neurons. And so once we see, like, how did this evolve, you know, we, looking at fungi again, it's a vast underground living network that connects all the root systems in the environment that's gathering information, you know, through electrical impulses, breaking down compounds to serve nutrients throughout the entire ecological forest, right? So it's this living net that we've been on top of our entire history that creates this compound in the cap and stem formation that creates this expanded states of consciousness. And so I think in a very real way, we can say it's one of the ways the environment talks to us. Right. In the same way within our body, 
the parts of our body also talk through chemical messengers, through hormones, through pheromones, and so on, right? And that's to create a state of homeostasis and to give information to the other parts of the system. Well, the ecosystem's always doing that too. You know, we're talking about every being in there has symbiotically been evolving throughout this entire history, millions of years. And so we're just seeing this whole larger system as part of a larger body. And so we can see that within ecosystems itself, but if we look at psilocybin, over 200 different species around the world, every uh, continent but Antarctica. So we're talking about this large framework of these compounds, and that's just psilocybin. You know, there's, I think there's over 2,000 plants that have DMT in it too, right? And all those plants are also interconnected through these mycelial structures. And so it seems to be that psychedelics seems to be part of the way that evolution moves forward. Uh, there's a good book that comes to mind by Ronald K. Siegel called Intoxication. He was a UCLA psychopharmacologist for 20 years, and he found that 93% of the animal kingdom actually alters their consciousness chemically, right? It is so large that he calls it the fourth drive of evolution. So after like food, water, and sex, given the opportunity, most animals will alter their consciousness chemically. So this idea that us evolving through these chemical comp compounds isn't just human, Right? It's a part of the natural kingdom. There's even a book called Animals and Psychedelics by Giorgio Saramani that kind of looks at the relationship between animals and psychedelics. So the only framework that made sense was a holistic one that really brings into account all the organisms in an environment. And this is part of a very long, deep process and that the environment has a lot of benefits to gain by us becoming more aware, specifically of our interconnectivity. You know, So one, one last book that comes to mind is um, – uh, by Richard Doyle called Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and Evolution in the Noosphere. He read, he's a professor of um, literature and uh, of technology at Pennsylvania State University. He read thousands of trip reports as part of his research, and he found out that the prime psychedelic insight, he would say, is that the participant realizes they're part of a vast interconnected living system, and they should be returned ecodelics. So we have compounds that bring ecological awareness. Ecological internally, you're saying all these parts within our system, but that we're part of a larger system. And this heals a sense of belonging, heals fragmentation, enlarges our identity, helps us want to contribute to part of this larger system, but also brings balance and homeostasis, homeostasis to the system at large. Hmm. And just to loop all that back to Gaia is Gaia would be the proposed sort of mind of the one – Ecos, like the of the one entity that is the entire planet of which we are sort of a an an, ex, an an expression and an iteration of and within, and the molecules, our beings, all the animals and plants and stuff are just various expressions of Gaia's sort of like intelligences operating within and with each other in the same way our sort of like parts might interact or um, yeah interact with each other inside the system that is our mind where it could be like a symphony ideally, mm -hmm. <laughs> or it could be like mm -hmm. a civil war, which many of us are experiencing internally to reference uh, Robert Falkner, his language, you know, our parts are in civil war and we want to get them in symphony and actually in some sense, an expression of where we are with respect to how we treat and even acknowledge the natural world or all like life beyond human life, which is a kind of civil war between what we consider to be valuable, which is what serves humans according to human desire, and everything else, which is a kind of civil war on life itself, with humans mm -hmm. being the ones who started it, mm. in a sense. Yeah. I think we civil war comes from the sense of not knowing that deeper sense of unity between the parts, right? So whether, I, you know, the sense of like – Looking at the borders even between countries, just realizing that we're all just human, we're all the same, and even deeper, we're part of a deeper, you know, you could say just biosphere. Um, it's that fragmentation of seeing other beings as deeply separate. It's us versus them of more of a um, – was it – not entheogenic. There's a word for it. So there's, there's like we move from egocentric to ethnocentric to co to world centric to cosmocentric using Ken Wilber's terms. So ethnocentric is the idea like I – identify with just my tribe a tribe could be like my sports team my country my religion and then there's other tribes and we're very vastly different then you can get into civil wars around ideologies or whatever and then we at some point see that's just a small construct even in terms of bodies regardless of what you know um culture ethnicity you're from we have two arms two legs our anatomy is the same you right like that's why doctors can work across countries it's just like the whole human body is so similar genetics all of it and it's it's a very small percentage that is different. 
but we tend to focus on those differences and that, that could be all we see. And then it's all of a sudden becomes okay to be at war and to fight. It, it, it's, you say, relaxing into seeing the unity between the parts that really allows that harmony internally and externally. And I think the earth, seeing us as one, helps create that context for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's shift. Maybe it's a shift. Maybe you'll pick the thread up because one of the things that you open your book with, and it goes throughout, like you are very scientifically minded, scientifically rigorous throughout the course of your book in the sense of how, like your manner of inquiry, and yet you're quite critical of scientific materialism. And I wonder if you can comment a bit on that because it's evident in how you're speaking about what you're speaking about that you're not leaning into sort of a physicalist or a materialist understanding of how consciousness comes to be. Um, and maybe you could speak a little bit to that. I'm going to read off a quote from your book as maybe sort of a, a jumping off point, um, and then we can go from there. The scientific materialism of modernity cannot make sense of the mystical experiences catalyzed by psilocybin and the relativism of postmodernism that reduces perspectives to cultural conditioning cannot make sense of the power of psilocybin to mediate similar experiences in people across the globe. No, th yeah, thanks for reading that. Uh, definitely deeply agree. It comes from a stage of I think there's development of paradigms and worldviews, you know, and I went through my own process. I was an atheist by the time I was 12 or 13. Um, very, you know, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of reason for me to move through that direction and definitely gave a lot of weight to conventional, you know, scientific perspectives. Um, physical reality is all we know, right? We can describe everything in terms of the behavior of the physical reality. And when it came to the point I had this huge, you know, psychedelic experience at 18 and shifted, things shifted, but I still wanted to pursue science. So I came in first as a neuroscience major, and then I uh, majored in uh, physics and mathematics for three years and realized that that still wouldn't give the interpretation or I guess you say the, the, the deep picture of what I really wanted to know. So the physical world, I'd say, is just half the picture. That's why I like an integral lens. There's still this you know, half of it we could say is these this physical expression, which science focuses on. Science really focuses on things that can be measured. Not everything can be measured. Love, you know, so this can't be measured. Um, Unless you can see uh, love as just a bunch of molecules smashing together to totally. force uh, right. primates to breathe yeah. or things to breathe. And in. it's so it's so reductive. You look at a molecule and like that's not that. Like let's look at psilocybin for example. I look at the molecule. That's not describing this huge plethora of, of experiences of feelings and archetypal imagery and the states of oneness that somebody's having. It's, it's ridiculous to just see like this molecule is that, you know, and all the images that can come in, all the artistic, you know, I expressions aren't contained in the molecule. Especially you could take it and it's different every time. It's not in the molecule, right? It's through this relationship, you could say, with, with a larger level of consciousness. And so I think there's a, a development from... Uh, specifically a scientific mind that's very kind of desensitized and really focused on describing everything in terms of just objectivity. And I think there's an evolution then towards modernity being like, well, that's not completely real. Everything is a cultural construct. And I think a lot of academia is there right now. And it's a nice deconstructive lens that's breaking down a few hundred years of science. And then I think there's a deeper level that comes mostly from direct experience or more of a spiritual lens that consciousness pervades everything, that there's some deeper truths that aren't even just cultural. Uh, for example, my experience of giving, you know, people mushrooms across cultures, really, we see a lot of the same images, um, archetypal, just you say sacred geometry at the beginning, uh, the same kind of animals that come up, the same realizations of oneness, regardless of your culture. You know, we have what Aldous Huxley calls like the perennial philosophy, regardless of the traditions at the core of the mystical insights of all the religions, we come to the very similar truths, right? And what I see is people that take psychedelics, regardless of the background, come to the same experiences that love is fundamental there's a deep sense of oneness, you know, um, that everything at some deep level is actually okay. You know, so these aren't cultural constructs. And so uh, the idea was to try to move people stuck in a rigidity of a paradigm forward. And that par those paradigms can't explain the um, existence of psychedelics, right? Like we can't look at, as I mentioned, psilocybin to make sense of it just from um, a physical lens. And we can't make sense of it just from a cultural lens, right? It's kind of like this holistic systemic view that includes consciousness. 
well, when things really start to have context and make sense. Hence, living systems and uh, a Gaia theory. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm really on board. And there's one thing that I have personally been kind of like chewing on and kind of struggling with and wondering what your perspective is. And it has this sort of like the Western academic reductionism translating into into or expressing itself through this looking at all, you know, from based on this uh, cultural relativism, looking at everything and saying like, well, let's get rid of all this extraneous stuff and just get down to the core of it. And now we can recognize what the foundational truth is, which I think actually is a very Western paradigm thing to do. I'm going to reduce all the things that I don't see as particularly valuable, identify what's common, call it fundamental like a particle and say, that's what's true. And sort of then all the cultural stuff is just, oh, that's just hoopla, you know, that's just people and their imaginations. But what's really real is this sort of fundamental truth. Even I think the concept of a perennial philosophy, as beautiful as it is, I think is actually an expression of that same like Western reductionist sort of like un- inability to see our own cultural model as like being like, oh yeah, this is what's fundamental. Like, oh no, this is what the Western viewpoint identifies as common. And that that is not not that that's not valuable, but that that too is a kind of sort of like cultural distortion, and that actually all of those, you know, I I, I very much agree that like just cultural relativism is not gonna there there is something deeper as well. There's deeper threads, but that all of that cultural stuff is as important as well because that too is a full expression of humanity through its different sort of cultural forms and that it's not extraneous data to get to some sort of core truth i'm wondering how you respond to that no i think it's it's well said and i think the movement forward to keep developing is including and integrating more right and so i think that's how largely how paradigms grow is all of a sudden we have all these anomalies that don't fit in the framework you know that happens with scientific materialism it happens with deconstructed postmodernism we need a perspective that includes as much perspectives as possible and integrates them, you know, in terms of like, they all kind of make sense with each other. There's, there's a less amount of contradictions. And I think it's, um, you know, just, just to, to kind of, uh, to your point, I ended up getting my doctorate in philosophy, cosmology, consciousness, looking at the main thoughts of Western history. And it's full of people, mostly men being like, I found the absolute truth. No, this is the absolute truth. And I'm breaking down everything into like just these axioms and, uh, you know, that's our mind trying to make sense of things, you know, and each person's like, I've got it. And I think we all have pieces to the puzzle, you know, and I think it's every, I like Ken Wilber's things like nobody's a hundred percent wrong. Everybody's holding partial truths. It's, it's the coming together of all these perspectives that we get a more of a holistic, uh, picture. And it is, I feel both. And when I'm looking, for example, from the lens of, uh, just using something like physics, we have somewhat the same physics in the structure of the universe throughout the entire cosmos, right? So there's, there's gravity. There's certain ways planets are going to form. Um, we have the same atoms throughout the entire cosmos. So there's a structure to – using physical reality as a mirror of consciousness to some degree, there's a structure to our physical reality that is universal. Right. That being said, physical reality is still always evolving. At some point, there was only atoms and molecules and cells start to develop. And then it just keeps getting more complex and varied as evolution moves forward and with the development of different kinds of cultures. Right. And this is just on our planet alone. But there is a fundamental sense of a shared structure throughout the cosmos. And I think within humanity, too, there's, you know, within all the diverse cultures of humanity for a large portion of it. Uh, about 4 million years, we were somewhat moving from primates to humans just in Africa, right? So there's a lot of shared history in our psyches. Um, but as we keep moving out, we become more individualized, even in terms of cultures, right? And I think that's part of the beauty is all these different kind of expressions and ideas. It brings a lot, a lot of novelty and newness and growth. So for me, it's all these differences that really are the precious parts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, I, I so I appreciate I brought it up because I appreciated your response. I think it has, for me, the the tension, and in some sense, maybe it's a tension against myself because I can, there's record, there's literally record on the internet of me saying things like the fundamental nature of reality at the time as if I actually knew what that was. Um, yeah. And that it wasn't just me attempting through my own sort of culturally informed and sort of idiosyncratic language describing something that is actually mystery and completely beyond all conceptual grasp. 
right? And mm-hmm. as soon as I try to conceive it and form it into a some sort of something and hand it to you, I've actually handed you like a dead artifact, you know, no longer animate in the way that it was when I touched it. Um, so I appreciate you bringing up that, uh, you know, the the differences, right? Because it's like, it is a both and, right? And, and then in that, it's like complexity, systems thinking, context, these types of sort of shifts into understanding the sort of nuances of reality and society and so on and so forth within these kinds of frameworks. So like understanding, like bring all the data in, let the full complexity reveal itself and then come to understand what systems are at play and how are they supporting themselves and how is the context of any given scenario informing how those systems are operating is interesting to me rather than what is the fundamental, like (laughs) what is the fundamental particle of the universe as that sort of thinking then expresses itself through the analysis of psychedelic experiences and their sort of like connection with various historical religions. And in some sense, I see it also expressing in this sort of like mystical experience dominance, right? Which is like, yes, the the mystical experience, right? And like, that's where the healing is. And that's where the thing is. People are like, I need the ego death. I need the mystical experience. And realizing like, wow, even all of, even the idea that that's like the that's the peak, that's the where we should be going, like that's where the value is. Even that too is that same sort of very masculine to the point, cut out the extraneous kind of um, framework, which I think, again, you know, without leaving in all that other stuff to enrich the complexity of it, sort of, I think it starts to amputate some profound value. And how would you respond to that? Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, I'm gonna appreciate your response. For me, it does come down to this like both end where in my personal life, it's it's the mystical experiences that have felt like the peak experiences and not from this kind of like dominance. This is better than everything else. It's just they've been the most transformative. And when I have felt the sense of in touch with the most amount of truth and not truth in, in an intellectual sense, I'm, my mind's like, I got it. It's just like your being really comes alive. You know, coming from a kind of framework that we are more than just this lifetime and body, if we have any part of us that is eternal, that's moving through lifetimes, it remembers to some depth everything that's happened, right? And so it's like some part of my being dissolves enough and gets into contact with this part of me that's connected with everything that I would say is has been forever, that is light and so on. And it has a recognition of some truths. And I think at the core, we all have those. It's a part of all of us and the recognition to the same truth. Um just coming back to my, like my very first one at 18 really, it's just, there was a sense that like I felt 110% more alive, you know, like I, this was the most real thing that's ever happened. It's the most alive I've ever felt. So part of it just comes into self-trust that I'm not just being fucked with. A part of me is really coming online. That's normally not online. And since then last 20 years, it, it's happened several times, but where like a both and comes in, you know, from, from my perspective now at 38, I, I do think this experience of mysticism and of unity, I think this core part of the mysticism is an apex um, in the sense that if I'm using a model of a pyramid, because it kind of encapsulates everything and it's a larger context than everything I can, I've come across or can think of. But there's an infinite variations of unity and of mystical experiences. And with all the unit of experiences I've had, each one has been different. I mean, we're talking about unity of the cosmos. Look at all the expressions, right? So there's the infinite ways for it to express itself, even in terms of a mystical experience. You can have a mystical experience of one with yourself, one with your community, one with the planet, one with all the cosmos, one with God. Sure, one right? with a all particular unitive. plant. Right? right. Yeah. All, all breaking this compound of individuality and merging with something else, I think, is more love and more freedom. But it's an endless expression of unity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. To, to further sort of like I, I love that, um, and to further sort of to to my point before, which is like and those experiences that are not peak mystical experiences, those also have value too. It's not like you've missed out on like the real thing because you didn't fully dissolve into the cosmos and instead just had like a moment with yourself and like your various parts and relived a part of your childhood and cried while you felt the you know the the trees or something or like Mm. just danced in joy and celebration you know that that that, that's not less of an experience it's just not uh it's just an experience that isn't oriented around a sort of certain like you said 
an apex rather than the mm. apex. And now yeah. I'm starting to feel my own ideas here move into the very edge because they're starting, you know, they get to the edge and they're starting to like dissolve a little bit and feel less coherent. So I'll maybe stop there because mm -hmm. I like being on the edge of my thinking. But in mm -hmm. the present social world, I don't like to say a whole lot of things I'm not entirely confident with because who knows when that's going to be thrown back in my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm only half kidding. Yeah. yeah. No, that's good. I mean, to, to what you're saying, I mean, I probably have had at least maybe 400 psychedelic experiences myself. Maybe a dozen I'd put in the level of mystical or so on in terms of like deep kind of unitive. They've been the most important in my life, right? But I'm like a dozen out of a few hundred, right? And they were all important and they were all meaningful and again from all of them. And so definitely it's not to discredit any experience that is not um, mystical. And I don't even think it should necessarily, you know, a lot of people come to the medicine work with that being a goal. I mean, when it's happened to me almost every time, I, I didn't even want it. It just spontaneously has happened, right? And so it's definitely like, wow, I wasn't even in the right container. One time it was at a concert, one time of a hike, another time in a parking lot, definitely not in the right kind of spaces. <laughs> they just kind of came up on themselves. Um, but there's so much beauty to what they have to offer aside from just that deep unit. I think they're very impactful, but... You know, there's ways to just play and to learn and to self-reflect and to be in community. I mean, just creativity when it comes to art. Like, there's so many other states of consciousness that aren't quite to that level degree that have tremendous amounts to offer, including what, you know, what psychedelics open us up to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Presently and historically, as you, you know, you explore, like I thought of it as reviving the stoned ape theory in your book, but you explore like all the different dose levels of psilocybin and the different ways in which it could have served our sort of I don't know if I'm using the right term here, but like evolutionary progenitors in their sort of development towards the modern human mind. And that, you know, low and medium and upper medium and high doses all had different roles and could contribute to the value of connecting in different ways and like different utilities of survival. Yeah, no, I love it. Now, thanks for bringing the, the Stone Ape back up. Um, I read Terrence McKenna's Food of the Gods at 19 and it left quite an impact. And over almost the next two decades of, of academia with a focus on evolution, including the evolution of consciousness, I hadn't come across a better theory that explained the emergence of humanity during all that time. And so I really, I felt it was a big part of me. There's just such a, I felt like a karmic soul pull of like, this is what I need to focus on. So in some ways I saw the whole book as creating context for that idea. Um, because for me, it had been the biggest idea I've come across because of its implications. You know, I'd been, as I mentioned, as a teen, really also focused also on how did we get here? We're, we have this huge missing link of how did humanity evolve? That's It's a big deal. Like, how do we know what we're supposed to be or where to go if we don't even know how we arrived? And the idea that there was a simple, put forward by Terrence and Dennis McKenna, that there was consciousness expanding compounds in the environment that over the course of time expanded our consciousness is the most simplistic and rational idea I'd come across. You know, and since the last 10 years, the science I feel has been, has been very supportive in terms of, you know, stimulates the growth of new neurons, not too many things. Things do that hyperconnected brain state. We know now there's you know archaeological evidence of uh, mushroom use all throughout the African savannas. You know, as, as we study more religion, we see you know shamanism being the root of almost all religious traditions. But also the use of psychedelics has been cross cultural at the foundation of almost all 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 shamanic cultures. You know, including Western culture. You know, we see the Illusionian mysteries and so on, and definitely all throughout the Americas. And so for me, this creates and shifts the deep identity of what it means to human, how we got here, our relationship with the planet, but also gives context to the larger psychedelic movement. Like how could we legalize something that made us human? And I feel it's only by becoming back um, in alignment with these Earth's natural processes of evolution that we can really move forward, you know, have these visionary realms so we can imagine a beautiful destination that we can then create. Mm. Yeah, it makes me think of, and, you know, like, pardon me to all listeners who know who I'm talking about, but it makes me think of uh, David Wolf, David Avocado Wolf. And uh, I actively don't want anyone to take much time to look into this guy unless you're going to look into some critical theories of him because I don't think he's a trustworthy sense maker, at least didn't become. And he might have just outright been a grifter from from what I know. Um but I was also very like moved by a number of his things early on in my sort of like journey, and uh, particularly his theory of just in every 
at, at the face of every sort of extinction, and I think maybe Stamets sort of picked up the ball on this, or maybe he was taking from Stamets for all I know. I don't know when the timelines overlap, but it's like with every sort of at the very beginning of life itself, and every time life has sort of collapsed, mushrooms have been there to support the reemergence. And it's this particular line that I liked, which was like, he's like, if you want to survive, align yourself with mushrooms. Mm. You know, if you want to survive, align yourself with the fungi, because they are the ones that hold this whole thing together, especially when things come apart. Um, and I think that was with respect to basically what we know now are calling functional mushrooms like uh, mm -hmm. lion's mane, for example, okay. uh, part in the product placement, um, chaga, yeah. and then also psilocybin as well. Yeah. No, it's, it's beautiful. It's, um, you know, there's three large kingdoms in, in terms of biology, the plant, the fungi, and, you know, the, the animal kingdom. And I think for a lot of us, we, we could just put plants and fungi together. And of course, plants are so much more in your face. You walk around, you see them. But you have this entire kingdom that's really created and set the soil in many ways, literally, for the other life forms to evolve. Um, fungi was likely the first good book recently came out, The Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake. Beautiful book. Um, yeah, it was the first root systems of plants. It really set the soil for plants to move on to land. Right, Literally then, created the soil. Right, as, as lichen broke down rock, and it's sort of like the decomposition of lichen having broken down the rock became soil. Like, I think he proposed that's how the Galapagos Islands happened. Lichen came in and started all of that. Um, mm -hmm. I hope I'm remembering that properly. I'm sorry. I just like, I got so excited when I learned about lichen yeah. in that book. I was like, man, what a crazy, amazing thing. Anyway, yeah. Please continue. Please continue. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so then plant life came out of the waters onto land. Then, then you have the insects, right? Then you have the amphibians moving into reptiles. I mean, so all the entire animal kingdom transformed onto land because uh, the fungi broke ground. Right. And another part in my research that really stood out, um, we know there's the KT impact about 67 million years ago. You know, large, you know, object comes out from the sky, really kind of destroys, you know, the reign of the dinosaurs. But it also created a space for um, for mammals to keep evolving, you know, eventually leading to primates to us kind of really kind of taking over the planet. But here you have the perfect condition for again, a fungi to really take over. So for those of us that have grown fungi before, you have this huge impact that comes in the sky, brings up all this dust and makes the earth really kind of clouded and dark for a large period of time, right? And it kills a lot of the plant life and a lot of the larger level animals. So they start to decompose, right? So you have this dark time with a lot of biofuel, a lot of material. So the fungi really takes over again. So for those of us that have grown fungi, there's about three weeks, the, the beginning part of life, the fungi needs to be in the dark. Right, hence why it's underground and it needs a lot of things to feed off of. So you have all this biomass now that's dead and decomposing in a dark container, and as it lifts, it created a whole new richer soil out of even more complex plant life to develop. So a lot of the plants life we have now came out of the death and rebirth that was transmuted by fungi from the other life forms that before the KT impact. So again, fungi again set the soil for the next stage of evolution after the reign of the dinosaurs. And maybe some of those know that before even plant life came onto land, there was huge, like 20 foot mushroom structures covering the entire planet. You know, you can see images on them. If you go on Google, if there's a representation of what they look like, but mushrooms used to be like 20 feet tall and, and were like the trees before plant life really came on and started to develop on the planet. Mm. And, and the very sustaining of plant life is entirely dependent on uh, fungi. You know, you sort of, you made mention that it's common for people to sort of lump fungi and plants together. Although like fungi and plants are in unity with each other, just like the animal kingdom in sort of living, resilient, sort of undamaged uh, ecologies. But without the fungi, there would be no plant life really because the sort of the entire system of soil and the interconnected roots, root system that allows for these animal, or the, sorry, the these ecosystems in order to communicate with itself and the various, you know, members of its uh, of its ecology is entirely dependent on mushrooms, and without them, you know that system collapses because it can no longer respond. Totally, 
No, 90% of plant life has a symbiotic relationship with mycelium. 80% of plant life would stop existing if mycelium stopped existing, right? So it's definitely like the ground of the biosphere. And we're all in such deep symbiotic union. I mean, we've always been slowly co-evolving together. We depend on plants, you know, for our oxygen, for our food, or even I, I, I turn vegan because of mushrooms, but even those that eat animals, it's like those animals are dependent on plant life, right? So our food or the fuel, right? Our entire body is coming out of plant life that turns sunlight into matter our oxygen is and the idea is well then is it too hard to say that the growth of our consciousness itself is also not partly codependent on these plants and fungi right our spiritual development not just our bodily development but our spiritual and intellectual development could also be growing you know so we're, we're always in this deep interdependent structure where each part is growing you know in relationship to the other parts also mm. yeah. So this might be more non sequitur than it is sort of coherently lateral. Uh, but with respect to sort of being in communion or relationship with the fungi, I want to get your perspective specifically on the voice of the mushroom and the sort of relationship that can emerge with, mm, we could just say whatever is speaking that voice or the mushroom experience itself or like essentially the learning uh and the the wisdom and the information it offers us so i'll just like leave that as like a chunk and like let you take it from there yeah it's definitely such a beautiful question that i think we will be inquiring for eternity um my personal response my belief is speaking with god and again this is coming from somebody that was an atheist for a long time uh, a voice first appeared at 18 and started speaking i was like is this real the voice is like yeah i'm bawling and there's a sense of this is this is god this is a voice this is the unity of the cosmos and there's there's an intelligence that holds it all together but for me also everything's an expression of God. Like there's only one being and it's talking to us all the time through the environment, through people, through dreams. And it just becomes more vivid in these psychedelic states. So even though within this being, there's a multiplicity, right? So there's other beings and archetypes that exist, but they're also an expression of this one being. Um, I remember I had a dream in which I saw this kind of angelic kind of man come down from the sky, but he was kind of dragonfly wings and looked like this just really kind of warrior ish coming down. And there's this felt sense of like, this is God coming down. And my response was like, I've seen you in so many forms. Why are you looking like this now? And he's like, I'm the come at every, whatever form it takes to talk to you most deeply in, at this moment. You know, so I'll take whatever shape it makes to conjure up a part of you that's needed, you know, in, in this instance. And then it just flew back away. You know, in that sense, I think that's what's happening within our dreams and in these psychedelic states, whether, you know, it's the I, a feminine voice, you know, or the more sometimes masculine mushroom or talking to the planet. And they're all mediums from which this unity to speak to us. And so that's how I hold it um, because of my experiences and, in, 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 you know, my paradigm. And it's okay to see, say it is, hey, the mushroom is speaking to me. You know, it's okay to say it's I is speaking to me. It's like there's truth to that. The same way I'm speaking to you right now, and I think there's a divinity behind you that we're all one and God's also talking through you. I'm also talking to James. Like they're, they're both true, right? So I can say the mushroom and I can say God, and it's, it's just at what layer we're speaking to. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then yeah. if we look at the sort of just like, just like our physical realm, right, we'll just say 3D reality is a multiplicity of individuals interacting as a coherent <laughs> or maybe incoherent uh, uh, okay. discordant whole, you know, then all these sort of uh, the, the various sort of intelligences that emerge in a spiritual type experience that may or may not have physical representation in the form of a mushroom or a tree or et cetera, that these are also sort of a multiplicity of beings that interact. So what is the sort of like specific role that the psilocybin fungi as as a being within that what's its role what do you see it doing with respect to the coherency of that whole and uh you know its relationship to you know the god or the larger whole that you experience yourself as being in conversation with yeah you know, during that same mushroom experience at 18, and I've thought about it every day since, you know, so it's definitely because it's the first time like the veil breaks down and you're like, this. there's a whole world so different than I thought. But this voice, 
which we could say the mushroom or God, what it said to me is that the point of life is, is love, but by a lot. Miles behind love is learning, and everything compared to these two values in that order is so insignificant and small that you will never have to worry about them as long as you keep these two values in order. You know, and and for the risk of saying like this is an absolute truth, it was my experience, right? But it for me so far, it's made sense in terms of universality. And so, if this is a shared value that love is also an expression of unity, when you love somebody, you want to move closer. And then there's this evolutionary reason of why we want to keep learning. We also, if you love somebody, you want to learn more about them. So, love's learning is also a way to get closer and more intimate with the cosmos or with any kind of subject matter or person. So, if these are kind of true they'd be true for every being including the mushroom right and so because of our deep sense of interconnection that i think is a fundamental facet you know whether it's ecology physics or whatever there's a deep sense of like we're, we're all in deep relationship with each other there's a lot of reason to help everybody around you humans animals plant life and so there, there's good incentive for the fungi to want life itself to go well and to be in balance, and to be in love, and to be in harmony, right? And, and just from an ecological standpoint, it's to create a more sustainable landscape, right? So the more loving we are, meaning there's also more inclusion of awareness of everybody else, and we're acting somewhat in harmony with each other and the environment, the mushroom can theoretically live forever, right? If the host environment is healthy, some fungi is over 10,000 years old. It's this living network system, right? So it has a lot to gain, uh, on a more personal level, even though fungi seems to be a multiplicity of beings also, it, that it can coexist if we coexist well and the host environment gets to live well. Guy is happy, you know, I mean, the whole universe is happy. So the same way when you're feeling really good, you want to help other people. I think that's an inclination running through all of life, right? So for us to also to keep loving and expanding with that because it's very healing um, and then to keep learning. Right. And I think those are two things it has to give us love and learning. And that includes creativity. It comes new ideas. It comes, it gives us courage as death and rebirth. So we can keep dying to old forms and be born into new ones. So I think that's an incentive is, is to help us to love and to learn. And by doing so, it also keeps, it, it grows its expansive love and it also keeps learning through us. New things are happening on the planet. It gets to see and experience new things as we keep developing and evolving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this very much aligns with uh, the proposition I was making in my fabled book that uh, was disrupted by a uh, truck on snowy roads mm -hmm. um, and may one day be a thing again, was uh, suggesting that if I were to be so anthropomorphic as to describe the mushrooms as having an intention, you know, then it would be like their intention is to serve the health of the entire system. And mm -hmm. with that, serve the health of the entire system also because that benefits them, because that entire system remaining resilient creates a system within which it can thrive, right? And that the psilocybin is playing a similar type role as it expresses through us by helping us get reconnected with the larger system. And it cares about the health of that entire system. Now, my added caveat there is it doesn't necessarily care about your safety, though or your ego's safety right mm. it's it cares about the health of the entire system right and so unless the context is such that you're caring for your own safety or others are caring for your safety then you it trying to serve the health of the entire system by say totally breaking down a bunch of structures and beliefs and so on and so forth within you then that could actually be quite harmful to your well-being if you haven't cared for your own safety, either explicitly by managing the variables yourself or by having somebody else actively managing those variables for you in order for the thing that the mushroom is doing to serve the health of the entire system to move through in a way that is safe for the individual consuming the mushrooms. How do you feel about that? No, totally. I think... You know, every being has a degree of autonomy. That's in movements are autonomy, communion, transcendence, even and looking at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy, you know, it's safety and security before you move to these other layers. I think it's each individual's job to the best ability to take care of themselves. It's just a need, right? There needs to be a focus on yourself also and self-love to be functional, sustainable, to be of service to others. And, um, you know, I'm not the big fan of... Uh, 
people, especially early on in their relationship with psychedelics, of just taking large doses and just crushing through their ego barriers to dissolving to whatever idea that they have is good for them. I don't think it's a compassionate thing to do. I don't think it's a loving thing to do, right? And they I don't sh- think it can. Personally, I don't think it actually has positive results. I think it can end up confusing people quite a bit. I think so. It's a shock to your system and it's shocking it because one, it's unnecessary. You don't need to go that way. You know, you can slow the fuck down and there's, there's loving ways to dissolve more gentle, you know, um, you know, I, I think we need more self-compassion to even have larger levels of compassion for others. You know, if, um, I'll focus on like 5-MeO DMT right now because it, it, a lot of people just blast off and there's ways, you know, that you could take it and just soften and soften and soften and dissolve and get to the same place with the same insights and impact, but more gradually and with ease instead of being like shot out with a rocket, you know, same with psilocybin. If you're at a point where like, hey, I really want to and I'm ready for that, that's different than thinking like this is the way things need to be done or the way that facilitators think need things, things need to be done. You know, it's, again, it's it's kind of like this forceful breaking through attitude that leaves a lot of rupture and hurt instead of an actual loving way moment to moment to moment, right? And there's, you know, it could be a more of a melty dissolve that feels good the entire time. And yeah, I think you can get just as much out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, I still think there's, um, that goes back to my concern before about like, you know, use the term and apex and i sort of celebrated that but going back to the concept of the apex of like the value of the psilocybin experience is the mystical experience and thus Mm -hmm. if i want to have a a good session i need to fully dissolve into the mystical experience and the reality is that that way of thinking that sort of reductionism we'll say, the sort of uh, Western reductionism, not to say that it's Western people are the only people who have ever reduced things, but like that has led to a lot of harm and it can lead to a lot of harm in the individual as well. As I've explicitly, I do integration coaching. I don't advertise it very much because especially since my car accident, I have very minimal capacities and resources internally. So I don't want to like get a lot of people messaging me, but it is available and people can find it on my site. And there have been a number of times that I've gotten contacted by people because they saw the research, they, you know, understood the narrative as it's coming out through the mainstream and ended up being like, oh, in order for me to heal myself, I need to have a full ego death. I have to have the mystical experience or else it's not going to help me. And the reality was is that they got more hurt and they were more damaged on the outset or on, on the, um, on the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, in the aftermath, we'll say than they were in the beginning. Um, and it's, it's, uh, sad, not sad, like pathetic, like sad, like it hurts my heart to know that people are, are being harmed because of the tendency for us to create these weird sort of like dominance narratives, even with an experience that is very much about, you know, uh, like you said, melting, it's very much about surrender you know no totally yeah I, uh definitely uh, a lot of resonance with what you just shared and um you know holding the space out in, in jamaica and so on a lot of people have come because like i want to have a mystical experience and they can really focus on this narrative and and a lot of times often what comes up for people is very personal instead of transpersonal and they might be doing just trauma work the whole time and then they feel really let down and disappointed and maybe like it hits their not enough food. Like, why don't I get to have the mystical experience? And I'm like, it's heartbreaking. I'm like, you're in pain dealing with trauma and then you're hard on yourself now because you're not having a mystical experience. And then on top of it, you're like, why not me? And all these things instead of like, let's do the trauma work. Like that's just as beneficial, right? And so – I kind of like that you get whatever you're needing in that moment and to, to move into the deep trust of that. You know, I'm a big fan of Stanislav Grof, and he says these catalyze holotropic states of consciousness, states that organically move towards wholeness. So whatever is needed in that moment is what's going to arise, right? And I think that's there needs to be trust with that. But it is, it is for me on this and heartbreaking when people are moving through a healing experience – and they can't settle into it and they're in disappointment because I'm not having this idea of a mystical experience instead of just being with that tender part of themselves that is actually needing that attention. Mm-hmm. And and in and in some sense, I, I, 
I have compassion for that too, because I know that that comes from like, like in your book, you speak quite often about this longing for belonging and the structure mm -hmm. of how our human societies are presently sort of like what we've evolved into socially and institutionally is very much a, a reductionism all the way, not just into individualism, but almost into isolationism especially since the pandemic, not making any comments on anything about it other than the inclination was for many of us, you know, responding to what's happening either by guidance or by sort of personal sense of the thing to increasingly isolate in a way that lasted so long and sort of continued to sort of like, uh, ooh, uh, ooh, uh, ooh, that it's like now that isolationism is even there. And I can see how, you know, there's this deep yearning of like, I still don't feel connected something's wrong and so i can i can get that too and i can empathize with it because despite my journeys you know and continued sort of exploration it still comes up it's still very real in the world that i live in around me and so why wouldn't i feel it still right absolutely i think it's partly just saying the structure of our society you know for most of human history but by far we lived in tribes you know we're talking about millions and or at least you say hundreds of thousands primates being millions and hundreds of thousands so our psyche developed in the sense that we're always a part of a group i mean we didn't even have individual rooms we're part of always this deep structure that's always there from birth to death and so that's what our being is used to is that level of connection and of that level of holding and that level of people have got your back and all throughout the day you're constantly connecting, you know, and, and I'm more introverted as, as a temperament, but I still know that, that that's what, what kind of is the most healing kind of component. Now we're very isolated. Each of us have our own room, sometimes own houses, own little boxes, and I think there's a lot of pain in that fragmentation. It, as a positive, it allows more individuality instead of conforming to group norms. So there's some evolutionary advantage of more creative and different expressions. Emotionally, I think you can bring a lot of pain. Let's say 70 or 80 percent of the people that come to me, they come for depression, right? So I think that that's most people moving into psychedelics now. A small percentage come for curiosity. A lot of people come because they're in pain. And what I have found the root of depression is, and I'm using those kind of terms, but this is the pattern I've seen is I don't like myself, you know, and that part of that comes because I'm so disconnected. There must be something wrong with me. There's a kind of shame that kind of forms. And so depression is, again, if we're this holistic system that's interconnected, depression is I'm feeling isolated and alone. And because of that, I feel like I'm also, or be, because of it, I'm, I'm not enough. And something is wrong and I don't like myself. Hence, it's hard to be in connection because I don't like myself. Other people might not like me. And the healing I have seen to all of it is learning how to like yourself. You know, you can say the self-love. It's used a lot like self-love. But to really come into good relationship with yourself is, is, is so much of my focus with the psychedelic work. Because it's only then that we can really be in deep relationship with others. You know, it's hard to be in a relationship with others when you don't even have a good relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, totally. Um, yeah. I think it was with my recent conversation with Robert Falconer that we discussed the sort of like, oh, no, it was with, uh, I think it was in that. It was also in my conversation with AJ Bond about how shame and how we close ourselves down can block us from being intimate with others because we don't let ourselves be revealed and thus we can never really feel close because we never really get seen. Um, and there was, uh, something else there that was coming up as you were speaking. Oh yes. You know, and it's not just from each other or in how we relate to each other in our living situation, socially and et cetera, but it's also very much, you know, the consequence of the, the consequence, I think maybe of the industrial revolution, certainly the consequence of like the long hang hangover that is the Abrahamic traditions where, you know, like actually this entire world and anything that connects you with like so that the deep earthiness of it is pagan and wrong and bad and heathenness and all the rest and that actually like this life is just a holding place for you to prove your values to an off-planet god through these <laughs> external structures so you could go to where your real home is and that this home doesn't matter all that matters is that you try to accord to these unreasonable excuse me expectations uh, uh for 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 moral behavior um that there's a real disconnection from the living beings that are the plants outside. It's not that we're isolated from each other. We're also isolated sometimes very literally in concrete jungles from the entire community of the trees and even you know the trees and the water and the landscape itself. 
And this is also something that came up with uh, with respect to my conversation with Darshan Naravais, who was also part of the kinship worldview conversation, was speaking to uh, you know when the COVID isolation protocols came in for a lot of people, there was the it was like there wasn't a and I'm still connected with life and I'm still connected with the plants and with the animals and with whatever else. It's like now I'm really alone utterly because there was only humans left. Mm. And there's something to that too. And and in respect back to psilocybin is how much it helps us heal that connection too, right? There's a lot of layers in which it sort of helps us heal our sense of connection to others, all others, and to connection itself. I like to call it like there's connection, right? With, and then there's connection with a capital C. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, I think so beautifully said. I don't, you know, um, for anybody that may fall like whether it's integral or spiral dynamics, that there's a development of paradigms. The most fundamental paradigm that was there for most of humanity was animism, right? And it's, you find it in all still indigenous traditions. It's at the beginning of shamanism. Animism is that the environment is alive. Right. And there's sometimes it's broken down. Each thing has its own spirit. All the plants have their own spirits. Right. But there's this huge interconnection play of everything of spirit being interconnected with all the other parts. Right. And you see, you know, kind of stereotypical kind of a lot of the way Westerners can look at indigenous traditions is like, oh, you know, you, know, you say father sky and, and cousin bird. And as the bird flies, it has a sign because it, you've really, the environment's always communicating with us symbolically also. And I think it's something that's massively lost. You know, I think the idea of even of integral is it was to integrate a lot of the past paradigms. That's where we get to a greater wholeness. But animism still wasn't integrated in many ways. And I think that's something that psychedelics really give us naturally. I think that's maybe even how animism evolved because when you take a you know a compound like psilocybin, the environment's all of a sudden breathing and alive and very vivid and speaking to you. You know, I think synchronicities arise and really kind of helps break us this world of isolation of like, wow, we're always in communication and dialogue with the reality and reality also, you know, being a part of the entire natural landscape. You know, so I think there's that sense once you see that the other isn't empty. That materialistic stance of everything's kind of dead end or not, but once you see it as living beings, including all the plants, then you can form deeper relationships with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and one of the things I hold, you know, very much like certainly the likelihood that there might be some level of being that it's just one totality, a singular totality. Cool, mm -hmm. I can get on board with that. My experience, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, is relational, and I live in a relational reality. And um, if something I learned recently is the recognition of how interconnected we all are, and how much even what we do for ourselves, uh, particularly in ceremony, are things that we're not just doing for ourselves, but for for all my relations. Um, that that matters to consider that. So all my relations, I recently learned, like, in at least in certain contexts, that stating that at the beginning of an indigenous ceremony is to recognize, like, this. Not only is this just not for me, but also, I I couldn't even have this if it wasn't for all of my relations presently, beyond humanity and across time. And it also reminds me of someone who I hold in high esteem, you know, Stephen Jenkinson. Who regularly uses the phrase of like you are a person of consequence, right? And to be awake is to be sort of like at the front of the boat of that yeah. consequence, you know, looking at your wake, both the one that the boat cuts through in the water and the one at the back of the boat, and recognizing like, yeah, I am a person of consequence, both intended and unintended. Um, um. Yeah. No, I love it. Definitely. I think taking, you know, if I had to give another word for what maturity looks like, it, it's taking more responsibility, you know, like for yourself and your consequences, but then responsibility for your community, the tribe, the planet. So I think the more responsibility we take, you know, the, the more we grow and develop in, in many ways. You know, another one, probably the model I use the most has been um, Abraham's Maslow's. 
Um, and even though it's shaped, you know, we see a picture of a pyramid and these stages of, of Maslow's hierarchy, you know, I'm reading a, a book about him right now. Um, he never created that pyramid model. Apparently it was some uh, business and marketing teams in the sixties because it was, it looked good for business that they put everything in a pyramid, but for him, it was far more holistic, like whole ons, like it was more like circles within circles. And, you know, his idea was that, and, and I've seen it to be true, you know, so I'm a big fan. There's just this developmental structures of needs. You know, if you don't have food, you're focusing on food. You need enough sustenance. And after that is security, you know, then belonging, then love and connection, right? And once that met, then you have self-esteem. And a lot of people in our country are there, but we're not a third world country. We have enough for security for somewhat. And so we're focusing on creating careers and identities and recognition. And then you have self-actualization. Like I know who I am and what I am. There's less fear of death. You know, there's more solidity of of self-worth. But he put another stage before he died he was working on for like 10 years called um transcendence and he put transcendence as a being of service right and that's where we get the deeper fulfillment it comes from a sense of a being of purpose and i think it comes from the acknowledgement that we are more than just ourselves right we're part of this larger structure and what i found throughout my work is that you know people we're, we're looking once we have the needs met of i'm enough and all that stuff the next focus is i want meaning in my life and that comes from being of service you know like my purpose is always going to be you know once it's past self interest to be beyond myself that's where meaning comes from is from giving so being part of this larger whole and living that way. So I think as humans, that's where we would find our ultimate fulfillment is of you know, being of service and purpose. Hmm. Right. And in particular, not it has to be from a place of no, not necessarily let me let me see this. I don't want to get too fundamental about this. There's there's stepping into transcendence as a as a consequence of the other sort of circles being whole right and then there is uh, a stepping into transcendence as a sort of defensive adaptation for a deep wound which is actually leads to a kind of service to others that is actually a kind of self-harming right like you just give on to others so much so that you end up suffering um, and being damaged as a consequence which is actually taking from others because of because people actually care about you you know, and um, and also eventually actually being taking on to others as they would have to step in to support you when your body and mind break down as a consequence of never caring for yourself. And I'm mm-hmm. thinking about um, what you had said earlier about self-love and self-care and the um, one of the principles of contact improv, a kind of dance form that I've studied for many years, and one of which is um, care of self as primary when you're mm-hmm. dancing, it's like, I am caring for myself and my needs and my safety so much so that I have lots of extra bandwidth. I've, I've done so well to do that that now I have lots of extra bandwidth to also care for my partner. And if both dancing, you know, both people in the duet, say it's a duet, um, are holding it in that way, all of a sudden there's a space for a lot more expansiveness. Uh, than there would have been if both were stepping in needing to care for each other because of a lack of capacity for care of self. But in that care of self means welcoming others in, right? Self-care often comes around like, self-care is what you do for me, and if you don't do for me, then you're going to fail at your self-care. But sometimes self-care is actually spending time with others. It's letting others in. You know, it's being, community is an important part of self-care as, you know, baths and scented candles. Yeah, no, I think, you know, very beautifully well said. And yeah, definitely it's like, a, I don't want to put the pictures like we're just sitting there caring from the whole and being selfless, but we're a part of the whole. So we always have to include ourselves in that level of care, right? We're, we're part of the circle that we're also caring and giving to. And, um, you know, we're born, I think, partly as an individual beings to help cultivate this personality, but it's also our responsibility to take care of this uh and a lot of also the, the work and it all ties together is, is learning to self-parent almost becoming this idealized parent that you wish you had and forming that relationship with yourself you could say inner child or whatever and rewriting those structures and it's, it's i think it fluctuates of how much attention should be on yourself and others you know but i think as a prescription even if just half of your attention is on yourself and meeting your needs and care 
there's the other the complete other half to give. And if everybody worked like that, we'd have half the people, like everybody able to give half their energy to everybody else too. It's very beautiful, but it's always fluctuating. Sometimes your needs are so taken care of that you only need 20 to 30% of your attention on yourself because everything's fine. You have a lot of bandwidth. And other times there's crises, heartaches where you need 70, 80% of your attention on yourself and you only have 20% bandwidth. Mm-hmm. And but I'm really I think feeling it's, that right now. Actually, I'm, I'm loving the way you're yeah. speaking to that and the wave of it because I'm really feeling I'm on that ladder right now. So, yeah. uh, and it's, it's, it's care. And then hopefully there's people around you if you need help that they have more bandwidth. So there's always this, you know, like ebb and flow in, in, in terms of this, you know, I mean, obviously if you need injury and hurt, all your attention needs to be moving towards you. And, and it's just a fluctuation during that moment. Um, but yeah, I, I, as you're saying, I don't think it's at service at all to if we self-abandoned. You know, it's definitely a, a tendency I had definitely in my 20s and early 30s. And it takes a lot to just stay grounded of yourself. This is your – you're a being that also needs to be taken care of. And it's your responsibility more than anybody else's in the world to take care of your being. You know, And it's only from that space, as you're saying, of, of fullness, of I'm actually okay, that we actually have you know, from that place of fullness to be able to really give to others. Yeah, I'm so I hear you on you're on the ladder right now on the bandwidth. Yeah, my heart goes out to you. Thanks. Right. Yeah. And this is probably the most sort of uh the most animate and sort of like intellectually myself uh conversation I've had in a while. So that's nice. Speaking of having the being in this sort of healing journey, that's a nice mark of progress for me. We'll see what the consequence of it are later. Sometimes it's very much like a doms and like come out the gym and be like, oh yeah, it feels great. And then like the next day you're like, <laughs> but we'll see how that goes. Um, yeah. I want to reflect, but no, it's been amazing. I feel like you've been very present, very intellectual, super engaged. It's been amazing. So I would never have known, you know, if you weren't sharing that, that that's been your experience in the background. Thank you for that feedback uh, or reflection. Um, I feel like it's time to draw to a close, and I have this, um, I have this selfish want, the selfish mm-hmm. want to ask you about something that you wrote about in your book. Yeah, that really, right. this is not where it fits into the conversation in any way other than with like the full admission <laughs> of it being like a selfish interjection because i want to have it put out in the world on my podcast Uh, that's what i want too for you (laughs) i I get a lot out of the actual interplay of each person's unique and they're pulling from their wants that's 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 it's more alive that way for me so there's joy in hearing that okay so here's what it is can you talk a little bit about you make a presentation in your oh I, i thought i muted my mic you make a presentation in the book when you're speaking about uh, the role mushrooms have played in the sort of evolution of the human of the human from a neurobiological standpoint as well as a consciousness mental capacity standpoint as well as a social standpoint at one point you speak to the genes that are responsible in the modern human for what we diagnose as adhd and neurodivergence Mm. and there being an intersection between like the genetic basis of ADHD neurodivergence as well as uh you know psilocybin and its role in uh in human evolution so I wonder if you could lay that on the lay that on for us yeah you know part of it came from research and part of it from studying myself you know I was diagnosed at uh at 15 with ADD and by 18, I wrote it off and I was like, this is something humans just made up, you know, uh, it's just classifying each other, the medications aren't helping, all this stuff. And then about five years ago, I was on uh, five hits of LSD and halfway through the journey, for some reason, sort of out of nowhere, thinking my mind about the ADD. And I'm like, I wonder, I'm curious if this is real. So while I'm on the five hits, you know, I take out the iPad, I start doing some research and I'm like, yep, I hit every fucking criteria of like what's what's ADD. Kept going down to the research, and I see that they've isolated the genes of ADD. So it's not just a human cultural construct, you know. It's a part of the physiology, and it leads to a different brain formation and a personality type, right? So it could be there's more sensitivities, and more creativity, sometimes impulsivity. There's a drive for novelty. There's a lot of things. I'm like, wow, yep, hit, hit, hit all these markers. But to see it as a a, um, a structural physiological element you know was huge and helped me have more acceptance for myself you know both my strengths and sometimes the shortcomings you know so for example 
I, I've you know went through doctor programs. I, I write a lot, but I'll read my paper twelve times and miss typos. I just oh, can't. Yeah. I, for, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Can't. Oh yeah. For the for for the life of me, and I'll go carefully. I spend a hundred hours, and I'm still missing typos. So that's where something like help is good. I'll hire an editor who's very skilled at that. They read it one time, they get all the typos. You know, so there's a symbiotic relationship that can form, and I get to focus on my strengths. And as part of the research, you know, I saw scientists have found that the, the genes go back at least 10,000 years, but of course, probably much, much more. And there was a lot of advantages for these genes of why they were passed forward. You know, they would share, for example, because sometimes the the ADHD, the hyperactivity or the, the urge to do things, they might have been the first people in the tribe to pick up a, a spear if there was a predator coming by. So there's a lot of braveness and courage. It's like even with your book, there's a breaking through of, of putting things out there. Um, but there's also, I would say at the root of ADHD, if we look at the, the neurophysiology, neurophys there's a lack of dopamine being made. So the brain's trying to bootstrap itself up, looking at a whole bunch of different things to stimulate itself to create dopamine. You can get dopamine for novelty and learning. So they also would have been one of the more restless types that moves migration forward. So there's some scientific papers that ADHD might have helped pull the sphere of migration throughout the planet, right? also look for new sources of food. Um, like I see in myself, like I have a drive and need for novelty and for newness, right? So that also can lead to growth. Um, if not done well, it also leads to not good experiences, right? So there's also a tendency for addiction and so on. Sure, hyperfixation. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's those that don't know, you can also hyperfocus with ADD, ADHD if you're really interested in something, right? So it's, it's sometimes the, the name doesn't really describe it well. But psychedelics are like novelty generators it's like forever learning and growing and different in its time so the people with add adhd would have been likely the first to new explore new sources of food come across find psychedelics if we didn't wait wait i mean the idea is eat primates some of them even eat fungi right so it would have been early on but we would have been constantly looking for new sources find these elements have these novel experiences been in trance would have kept going back to them brought them to the tribe you know and it, it would have played a lot of the personality structure, a lot of pivotal roles in the finding of it, of the inclusion, the keep using of it. And so, um, yeah, I think historically it really helps add a lot to the picture. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, selfishly, as somebody with ADHD and has spent quite a bit of time internally as well as externally having the sort of shame and guilt complex of like not focusing and so on and so forth and failing to sort of meet these basic human expectations but that are actually socio-cultural expectations. I don't know if you can hear my, pardon me, my stomach rumbling. Um, to hear you make the proposition that it's possible that the very evolution of human consciousness that became our capacity to self-reflect and be in all this, you know, like have the human consciousness that we understand consciousness to be now was a consequence of people with ADHD leading the charge in being the first ones to pick up psychedelic mushrooms and be like, hey guys, this is great. Let's keep doing this. Uh, it just like, it was kind of a selfish appeasement of like, yeah, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> it also explains a lot as to why I was so excited and being like, what are these mushroom things? Even at a young age, like, right. what are I want to find these. I want to try these. Well, that was interesting. I want to do that again. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I mean, it's correlated with creativity, ingenuity. So a lot of people that create things in the tribes with tool making, art, and so on, likely have that kind of, you know, personality structure. So there's an openness to experience a lot of times when people have this personality structure. So it, it would have done well. And yeah, I mean, for me, the owning of it like, in my 30s helped release some of the shame too of like why some things just a little bit more difficult for me, you know, and it's just – um. And I think maybe we'll come up with a better name at some point, you know. I, I know the gene they've isolated, sometimes they call it the wonderlust gene. Again, the drive for new experiences, more likely to travel and do things. Um, it's just – we're also just more fascinated sometimes with things. But So it's only in the modern-day context where people have to sit in desks at school for like eight hours and sit still and focus on whatever somebody's telling you and kind of like – People with ADHD aren't the best at following the rules or staying in a structure, you know. So it's only in this modern day kind of way that it's been a problem. But in a tribal setting, there's a lot of characteristics that would have been celebrated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was oh, what just what just came to mind. Oh, yeah, like shifting the name of the diagnosis from attention deficit hyperactivity disorder to like mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 
novelty wonder the the novelty wonder complex excessive novelty yeah. wonder complex or something and be like i'm sorry ma'am it appears as though your child might be wonderful <laughs> right <laughs> And I think that's the drive. It's for novelty underneath. And, and for me, where this is, I really love this. Uh, it got really into Terrence McKenna. And the two pools of the universe is, is habit and novelty. And novelty is just barely winning. That's why we have, you know, evolution taking place. There's newness. And so there's a drive to be at the front of the evolutionary process. You know, for me, there's a hunger for novelty, but it leads to expansion and growth. You know, there could be a restlessness sometimes or what looks, I feel really responsible, but irresponsible to others because it's not the way they're normally living. And so like so to a prior, you know, even 10 years ago, taking psychedelics might have seemed irresponsible to some people. Now it's like, hey, this is leading edge, right? So there's a way of moving towards a forefront and being experimental. And, you know, it's, it's part of that personality structure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, the irresponsibility thing, I imagine it also has a lot to do with uh, people with ADHD, at least in my experience, having very low object permanence and... Uh, <laughs> remembering to call if it's not written down or like logged into my phone is a uh, well anyways we'll, we'll we'll save that aside um mm. this is great uh yeah. why don't we end with a question and i think it's a question that you've been answering throughout the entire uh podcast but i i, I feel excited to see how you would cohere it into a into a statement into sort of a, a an offering to end us out here um which is this what do you see as what psilocybin is offering us give, given everything that you understand about its evolution its role in human evolution and human consciousness even fungi and the planet and everything else what do you see as what psilocybin is offering us now with respect to where uh with respect to our evolution in the face of the consequences that are um, the consequences of the last 10,000 years, we'll say politically, environmentally, economically, the troubled times that we're in, you know, what do you see as what psilocybin is offering us now with respect to our evolution in the face of the troubled times we are presently in? Yeah. What's coming to my mind is, is a quote from Fritjof Capra. He's a systems thinker, wrote a lot of good books, uh, The Tao of Physics, The Web of Life, The Hidden Connections, The Systems View of Life. It's some great work, and he's the line that really stood out. He says all these main problems going on in the world, whether you know it's um, – from slavery to like the breaking down of some agriculture to tribal warfare to the economic systems to what's having in terms of our ecological devastations of climate crisis, all these ultimately come down to a, a crisis of perception. And the perception is that's on crisis is that of fragmentation, right? So we're not having this holistic collective picture that everything's actually interconnected. And for me, the only way that change of perception can take place is by a change in consciousness, right? So there's a lot of systemic things that need to change. I think economics, I put it at the forefront, I put a lot of book because I think the ecological problems are happening largely because of economic reasons. Um, slavery was partly an economic issue. You know, a lot of the civil stuff happening in this country is economic issues. And so that system needs to change. And right now the systems-based capitalism is a lot of selfishness, focused on self-individual gaining a lot at the expense of the environment and the others. And so when the individual begins to really kind of dissolve part of its rigidity and see I'm part of a larger whole, that we can create a new system. And I know nothing coming close to being as effective and as efficient as psychedelics uh, in terms of transformation. Uh, I spent a lot of years with meditation, a lot of therapy, a lot of other methods, and they're all amazing, but they're not as quick and they don't go as deep. You know, psychedelics, they're nonverbal. They get to the very structure of your being, while something like therapy is just stays at a surface level many times. And I did two years of somatic psychotherapy using even the body, still doesn't go as deep as psychedelics. And so I think they can have a radical transformation of who and what we are and changing by that identity and including maybe even our history is the only way we can really create a new path forward. You know, by changing the relationship with ourselves, we change the relationship with the world and everything else. And I think it's a, an essential shift that needs to happen. I think there's no way to do it without their help. I think it would have happened by now. Uh, without the use of psychedelics. So I think all the meditation, all the therapy isn't enough. We do need structural changes, but the individual needs to change first. And as I see it, is these are part of the Earth's natural structures and 
you say processes, and we're simply coming back to alignment with them. You know, we're we're re-evolving, coming back to when you say revolution is to evolve again. We're coming back into alignment with those evolutionary processes. Great, thank you so much uh, for that and for the whole conversation and for your book. Uh, yeah. This has been wonderful, Jahan. Totally. Uh, mm. Thank you. And where can people? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I'll give you a chance to respond there before I jump yeah. in with the next thing. Yeah. First, I mean, it's just such a joy uh, to speak with you. I've been looking forward to it. You know, I read your book years ago, so it's amazing to be. It feels good to be in dialogue with you, get to know you more as a person, and the, I enjoy your presence and the high level conversation. You know, it, again, it's it's been a, quite a joy and wonderful to be here with you. The book um, is on all the platforms, uh, published North Atlantic Books, you know, distributed Penguin Random House. So it's on, it's on Amazon, it's on Target, it's on Barnes and Noble. So it's pretty much everywhere you can find books. Um, and the uh, audio book came out recently, so it's also on Audible. Uh, my website's psychedelicevolution.org. You can just read more about me and so on. Um, but yeah, the book is widely available at this point. Excellent. Thank you. My My final question was, where can people follow more about your work and get your yeah, book and you so, on yeah. so forth? So yeah. uh, you answered it for me. Uh, Maybe I'll say the title. It's the, the Psilocybin Connection, Psychedelics, The Transformation of Consciousness and Evolution on the Planet and Integral Approach. Yeah. 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 Great. Well, again, thank you so much. And, uh, uh, and that's it. <laughs> so it's an honor. And it's an honor. Yeah. Hope to see you again and cut. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed it. Please do follow up uh, with following Jahan and checking out his wonderful book, The Psilocybin Connection, uh, Psychedelics, The Transformation of Consciousness and Evolution of the Planet, An Integral Approach. Now, the integral thing is especially you might find interesting if you've been following integral theory or Ken Wilber or find any interest in that because he does have a very thorough sort of explanation or exploration of how we can understand the role psychedelics have played in the larger evolution of consciousness on this planet through the lens of integral theory, which I found very satisfying and you might as well. And of course, if you did find value in this episode, another way to uh, reflect that is by some financial contribution to the podcast, either becoming a patron, leaving a one-time donation, purchasing something from one of the shops, digital or physical items. Um, links are all contained below. Or alternatively, you can follow up with one of our affiliates, in particular, the people who sponsored this episode, which is the Synthesis Institute and their upcoming live stream, the evolving psychedelic ecosystem. So let me give you a little bit about this and why it might be cool for you to sign up because, well, it's free, <laughs> which is cool. Uh, and uh, it's coming up in just a few days. The evolving psychedelic ecosystem is an expert led panel discussion focused on the current state of the psychedelic space and will explore the impact, innovation, and insights we are experiencing as access to psychedelics expands. Register now to secure your no charge seat at this unique live event where you'll meet and have the opportunity to interact with renowned psychedelic experts who will be revealing what they see on the horizon for the rapidly changing psychedelic landscape and the impact expected on those co creating this burgeoning space. Guests are Alex Belser, Sarah Reed, Kalea Taylor, and Julian Vane. And again, it's happening September 20th. That's this coming Tuesday, if you're listening to this when it first come to, comes out, September 20th, 2022. And you can jump over by heading to jameswjesso.com forward slash psychedelic ecosystem or following, following the links contained anywhere you're watching this. There are links that you can jump over. So I'm going to be attending and I'm looking forward to it. And hopefully I will see you there. And uh, this is it. This is the end of the show. Thank you so much for tuning in all the way to the very end. Um, I'll see you Tuesday, September 20th. And or I will see you on the next episode of Adventures to the Mind. And until then, take care.